Hey everybody, this is going to be week 29 of your fifth and sixth grade science. So for the last several weeks, we've been talking about weather and climate, and it's been really fun to see your different uh, experiments and uh, models that you've done to show uh, the different uh, things that we've talked about. So uh, right now, the the lesson that you guys are working on from last week had to do with atmosphere and the different layers of atmosphere. And I wanted you to go ahead and list what all five of those are and a, and a brief explanation between each layer to let me know that you, you know what that layer is and what it means. And then I wanna to continue to see those. So um, hopefully I'll be able to see a few more of those. So I know that you've got that under your belt. And then, after weather and climate, now we're moving on to ecology. So for our last three weeks of science, we'll have lessons that have to do with ecology. And what is that? What is ecology? If you've got a piece of paper handy, and you wanna write down a definition, or you have a guess of what you think the study or the science of ecology is, write it down or mention it to the person that you're with. And then I'm gonna read you a definition of ecology. So. Ecology is the study of relationships between living things um, and their relationship to what's around them. So if you're learning about relationships, of the, the different kinds of fish, the relationships that fish have with other animals, including humans, um, and the plants around them, then you're learning about ecology. Did that make sense? Did I bub that enough? Uh, the word ecology comes from Greek words that mean study of the household. So that means that ecology is the study of the household of living things, their neighbors, and their neighborhood. Ecology includes not only how living things interact with each other, but how they interact with their physical environment. Um, things such as climate and weather and soil. So ecologists are the scientists that study ecology. They learn all about living things um, and they keep track of what they find so that we know how different uh, organisms and living things interact with their surroundings. Some ecologists study a specific species or habitat. Um, they might study the behavior of a single species to see how it interacts with the other organisms in that environment. Or an ecologist might study many different species that depend on each other, like a food web, for example, or they compete with each other for food and space. So there's many fields of ecology and many things to discover. So an ecologist is a scientist that studies living things and their relationship to one another and their surroundings. And then ecology is the study of uh, the relationships of those relationships. So when we talk about ecology, we're talking about uh, ecosystems, we're talking about habitats, food chains, like we mentioned, environments. So these last three weeks, um, those are the things that we're gonna hit on. Today, we're actually gonna talk about um, ecosystems. Did you guys know that in Utah, we have three main ecosystems? Each one of those ecosystems has very specific uh, conditions and plants and animals that survive there and rely on one another. Do you know what those three different ecosystems are? We're gonna go and we're gonna watch a slideshow together. Not that. And we're gonna look through the different ecosystems of Utah. Maybe. Okay. So any of you that have done any kind of traveling or looking around in Utah, you know that we have definite and distinct differences from uh, the mountains down to the deserts and the wetlands. So three different and distinct ecosystems. And as you know, and have probably observed, the plants and the animals that live there are different. Now we do have overlap. Some animals and plants maybe could live in more than one ecosystem, but for the most part, each ecosystem kind of has their own uh, plant and animal life. So let's go through each one of those. So the first one is our Utah mountains. Don't you love it here in the mountains where we live? Now I know some of you live actually on the mountain, but I love to be able to see the Utah mountains. So your alpine and forest. If you guys want to read aloud with me on these slides, it's great for you to practice um, your speaking 
and, uh, and your reading. So let's talk about forest. The forest biome accounts for about 25% of Utah. Generally, forest areas have all four seasons and extremes in both hot and cold temperatures. Now we can attest to that, right? We get to experience, some of them might be shorter than others, but we do have four distinct seasons. Right now we're in spring and we're seeing um, the temperatures and the weather that comes along with spring. And then when we get to summer, we'll see that real extreme heat um, during the summer months. Fall sometimes is a little bit shorter. And then winter, we see definite extremes in cold temperature and snow and uh, those all four distinct uh, seasons. Sorry, couldn't remember what I was saying. Um, so there's enough rain to support abundant plant life in the forest and the soil is nutrient rich due to the high plant and animal life in the area. Dense vegetation is found with many trees. So dense means there's a lot it's packed in. Many trees, shrubs, and low-lying plants that fill the area. Trees are both deciduous and coniferous. Now the next slide, I'm gonna show you what that means, deciduous and coniferous. Um, so see if you, you know that and you recognize those names. Uh, but trees have bark that protect them against our really cold winters here in Utah. So here's a deciduous tree, and that means that their leaves will fall off. So the very epitome of fall, when we see the leaves fall. And then we also have coniferous trees that stay green all year long. So here's a couple of fun facts about Utah's specific trees and some animals. Um, specific to Utah. So the original state tree of Utah was the blue spruce. That's what that looks like. Many of you might have those in your house um, during Christmas time or planted out in your yard. They're a plant that grows here in the mountains. Beautiful blue spruce. But our new state tree is this one, the quaking aspen. So any of you that have been on hikes or up in the mountains, maybe up in the Uintas, you see these quakies all over the place. We have them all over in my yard. They're beautiful, beautiful trees. Um, I love the shape and the look of those. Did you know that our official state animal is the Rocky Mountain elk? Now elk spend most of their lives living in family groups and herds. I gotta move myself so I can see what's going on. Uh, they'll flourish anywhere. That means they'll you know, their population will grow and they'll do really well anywhere where there's enough water, food, and shelter, including wetlands and high elevation deserts. So here's an animal that, although that they're a forest animal, they might be able to survive and they kind of cross over into some of those other ecosystems. So elk are herbivores, which means they eat lots of meat. Just kidding. They eat grasses, berries, wildflowers, and cattails. Shrubs, twigs, pine needles, and juniper trees are what they eat in the winter. Now a bull elk, a male elk, a male elk can grow up to five feet tall and uh, at the shoulder and weigh from 600 to 1200 pounds. Big guys. They have antlers, not horns, um, and they can weigh up to, well their antlers can weigh up to 50 pounds. Big. The female, which is called the cow, is she's smaller and does not have antlers. Now they have a really loud, it says a piercing call. Um, it's a bugle call. So any of you that have ever done any elk hunting or you've seen or heard the elk in the forest, you, you know what that sound is like. Um, so it says in addition to that call, that bugle call, they can bark or mew or squeal. Kind of fun. Let's see. Oh, let's go back one. We missed the bee. How many of you knew that the state symbol is a beehive? Have you seen maybe on any of the, uh, when you go to the state capitol or anything that has to do with the official state of Utah, you've seen the beehive. So does it make sense that the official insect of Utah would be the honeybee? Um, honeybees can be found all over Utah. Bee pollination is critical to plant and human survival. And then beeswax and honey are just the the nice byproducts that we get from this tiny wonder of nature. The plant world expends a lot of energy attracting bees and other insects with their brilliantly colored flowers and sweet nectar. And nectar is produced only to attract pollinating insects. All right, the red fox. The red fox has a litter of one to 10 in the spring every year. 
The young are born blind and aren't able to open their eyes until they're about two weeks old. Now, red foxes are nocturnal, but it's not unusual for them to be spotted during the day. They have exceptional sight, once they can open their eyes, <laughs> um, smell and hearing abilities, which makes them great hunters. Unlike other mammals, the red fox is able to hear low frequency sounds, which helps them hunt small animals, even when they're underground. They are omnivores, which means they eat plants, especially blackberries, apples, and plums, but they also eat rodents, such as mice and pika. They eat birds and amphibians, such as frogs. Now, the alpine biome of Utah is found above the tree line at about 10,000 feet. The soil in the alpine is very rocky and has little nutrients. Uh, little nutrients. The alpine has high winds and little precipitation in the form of rain. So these conditions are dry. They dry out plants and they require adaptations for their survival. Plants in the alpine are usually less than 12 inches tall. Some of the plants have hairs which help keep them warm. Plants also grow in clusters to increase their warmth. The alpine plants also need tough leaves to withstand the wind. move this for me. Okay, here's this guy. The yellow-bellied marmot rock chuck is a large ground squirrel. It's native to the alpine regions of Canada and western United States. It typically lives above 6,500 feet. They live in burrows and colonies of up to 20. Marmots are, they are, they are active during the day and they feed on plant materials insects, and bird eggs. They hibernate for approximately eight months, starting in September and lasting all through the winter. The American pika is another species that is found in the mountains of Western North America, usually in boulder fields above the tree line. They're herbivores and smaller relatives of rabbits and hares. Not very many birds call the alpine zone home year round. In fact, the only one that lives there all year long is the white-tailed ptarmigan. This bird can't stand getting too hot, and if it warms up, it will put snow on itself to cool off. <clears throat> During the summer, many other birds can be seen in the alpine zone above the tree line. These other birds that pass through the alpine zone include falcons, finches, larks, ravens, and sparrows. Alpine plants are adapted to the harsh conditions of the alpine environment, which include low temperatures, dryness, ultraviolet radiation, and short growing season. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, so we've gone over forest and alpine. Now let's move down to the Utah wetlands. So many of you guys have probably been out um, and kind of experience the wetlands yourself. So let's learn a little bit about the animals and the plants that are in the wetlands. Look at those pictures, isn't that beautiful? Looks like just out west of me. So one animal that loves the wetlands is the American beaver. Um, they make their homes or lodges out of sticks, twigs, and mud in lakes or streams. Their inner bark, the inner bark, twigs, shoots, and leaves of trees are an important part of the beaver's diet. Beavers are important in wetlands because they can change a fast-growing forest into a pond where many animals now live. Uh, they make this change by building a dam to stop the flow of a stream or a river. Oh, ingenious guys right there. Love that. Um, here's four other animals that live in the wetlands. Uh, the American bullfrog which it says is not native to Utah, the leopard frog, tiger salamander, and a red-eared red slider. So many reptiles and amphibians will live in the wetlands. Look at their different adaptations. See some of their camouflage that will help to keep them safe from predators. Probably the most famous plant found in the wetland is the cattail. How many of you guys have gone hunting for cattails? When I was little, I thought those were hot dogs. 
Okay, so now let's move on to Utah deserts. Now, the biome with the largest area in Utah is the desert. Deserts have dry rock and sandy soil that cannot hold much water. Days are hot and nights tend to be cold. There's a scarcity of precipitation, so I mean there's not very much, uh, in a desert and plants and animals have to be adapted to survive on their very little water. All right. The deserts of Utah are inhabited by animals that have unique adaptations for surviving in the extreme heat, dry, and sometimes cold temperatures of the desert. When you're thinking of a desert, you don't always think of cold, do you? Uh, many of the animals survive in their deserts through behavioral adaptations, which means during the heat of the day, they can be found underground in burrows or sitting in the shade of a shrub or a tree. Kind of like we would want to probably too. Uh, reptiles such as the desert tortoise, right there, and the Gila monster, spend almost all of their time in a burrow under a rock. So if you were living in the desert, that'd definitely be a place where you'd find some, some shade and a little bit better temperature. Many birds and mammals are most active near dawn and dusk when the temperatures are the coolest, yet there is still enough light to see. Bats and snakes and rodents are nocturnal and only active at night. So I can't read that because my face is in front of it. So here's some of the adaptations. Um, morphological adaptations related to the shape or color of an animal's body are also important for living in a desert. The, this lizard has a long legs and toes that keep its body away from the hot ground, reducing heat absorption. All right there, he can kind of prop himself up higher off the ground. White-tailed ground squirrels will use their bushy tails as a shade umbrella and the long ears of a jackrabbit aid in dispersing body heat. So there's some of the adaptations in there, the way that their body works that will help to keep them cool and help them to survive in the desert. The kangaroo rat has perhaps the most amazing combination of adaptations for desert survival. Not only does it live in a burrow and is nocturnal, but it recaptures its own body moisture by storing food within its burrow. Dry seeds absorb moisture from the kangaroo rat's breath, which condenses more readily in the cooler underground temperatures. Now, those of you guys that took Animal Encounters two years ago, we watched a whole video on the kangaroo rat, if you guys can remember him. What a crazy creature. Uh, if the desert gets too hot, many animals uh, will estivate, which is similar to hibernating, but it's usually in response to the lack of water rather than a lack of food. The spadefoot toad spends 10 to 11 months out of the year buried in the soil, only to emerge to breed and feed during the summer rainstorms. Many desert plants beat the dry heat by storing plenty of water in their root stems or leaves. So when it rains, these plants absorb a lot of the water quickly before it has time to evaporate. Many desert plants have thick waxy coating which helps seal in the moisture so it doesn't evaporate. Plants need to protect themselves against thirsty animals so they protect themselves and that water supply by having prickly outer, outer surfaces like a cactus. Um, or if they're not just prickly, they might even be toxic, and that would deter any animal from coming and getting at the moisture inside. All right, now, you guys are gonna be able to play a game. You're gonna do this on your own. Um, I will go through some slides with you here in a second. But this is the way your game is gonna work. It was just that tiny little corner. Now you can see the whole of me. <laughs> so what I've done for you um, is I want you to be able to Kind of play a game and see if you can identify which animal or plant belongs in which biome or which uh, which in, uh, ecosystem. So, what I've got for you, I forgot to get out of here, is you'll be able to print these two different worksheets. So the first one will have the four different ecosystems. You'll have the wetlands, desert alpine and forest. So you can print those out and cut them out. So you'll just have a little piece of paper and you can put them down in front of you. One, two, three, four, however you want. If this isn't something you want to print, just take four different pieces of paper and write down alpine, forest, wetland, desert. So you'll have, um, it's kind of, we're going to do kind of like a sorting game. 
So you'll have those different uh, ecosystems in front of you. Then this page has all of the different animals, a lot of them that we already talked about, um, some that I'll show you in some pictures in just a second, but you can print this out and you can cut out each one of those little squares and then you can put them in a baggie or in a bowl and you know mix them all up and then what you're going to do is you're going to draw out the beaver and then you're going to quickly as fast as you can put him in the right ecosystem so there's animals and plants there so that could be fun see if you can sort those out okay um well, that's just kind of a fun game to see if you can remember uh, which one of those animals. Maybe you could time yourself and see how fast you could do it. If it isn't a game that you wanna play, I'm gonna link these biome cards right here. And we're gonna be able to look at these beautiful pictures, you guys, so pretty. Um, I wouldn't expect you to go ahead and print these at your home. They're just, that would take a lot of ink, and, but they're so pretty. So you can look at these, and those are linked on your uh, four-week supply sheet. But let's just go through and do a fast review before you decide to maybe play that game, or this can just be kind of a fun review after our slideshow. But look at that. There's a picture of the wetland. Um, wetlands are transitional areas between water and land. The land has slow moving or standing water most of the year. In Utah, these may be salty wetlands near the Great Salt Lake or freshwater. Plants need to cope with the changing water levels. The surface terrain is soil that is water saturated. The weather is seasonal with a range in temperature and precipitation. So pretty. So there's your desert biome. Deserts are very hot during the day and cool at night. The land is dry. Um, has sandy soil and it receives very little precipitation, very little rain. Utah receives an average of seven inches of precipitation per year. So to be classified as a desert area, it has to receive less than 10 inches per year. The surface terrain is sandy with little nutrients for the sand um, in the sand for plant growth. Here's our alpine biome, our alpine uh, ecosystem. Uh, the alpine biome is found in Utah's highest elevations above 10,000 feet where the snow and frozen ground are found almost all year long. The weather is windy and there is much precipitation, but most of it is in the form of snow. The surface terrain is very rocky, so plants don't have long root systems and trees usually do not grow here. And our last one is the forest. Whoops, the forest biome surface terrain has rich soil and it's densely inhabited by plants and animals. There is a temperature fluctuation depending on elevation. Different plants are found at different elevations. Generally, there is rain or snow throughout the season to sustain life. So there's your five ecosystems, your five biomes. And then here's pictures of the different uh, animals and plant life. So you've got quaking aspens, where would they go? Pine trees. That spotted elk, or just an elk. The honeybee, red fox, marmot. You guys can see their pictures again. Pika, a Pikachu. Um, tarmig ptarmigan, beaver, red-eared slider, bullfrog. Those cattails, not hot dogs. Tortoise, colored lizard, ground squirrel, cacti, great basin rattlesnake, hummingbird. Okay, so each one of those animals um, and plants are on your biome game pieces. So you kind of have a visual, you can go back and look at those. So what you can do is you can print out those two sheets and you can cut out the little pieces and cut out the big biomes cut out the, um, those four different ecosystems, and then maybe do a fun little game and see if you can remember which animals and plants belong in which biome. Now, there might be some that overlap a little bit. That could be fun to figure out too. Uh, one other link that I'll have on your additional supplies is a website where you can go in and build a biome. 
you can go in and put the correct kinds of plants and animals depending on what kind of ecosystem it is. So if it's, you could build a desert biome or build a desert ecosystem and you'll be able to pull different plants and animals in there. So that's really fun. And I, that link is there and you guys can go ahead and kind of uh, play around with that and see how it goes. So ecosystems and ecology, uh, ecologists will kind of continue this for the next couple of weeks. But for this week, um, I just want to make sure that you guys remember the study of ecology the relationships of plants and animals to each other and their surroundings, and then that an ecologist is a scientist that studies ecology. Um, remembering, and as you guys are out driving around and looking around, that we have four different ecosystems in Utah, all very different with plants and animal life, um, and they're uniquely adapted to live in that specific ecosystem. So we've talked about this a lot. What a cactus do very well um, in the wetlands, Maybe not. Uh, what about the trees up in the alpine ecosystem? No. So they all have their specific uh, animal and plant life there, and then how they adapt or how they uh, how they work with each other, and who depends on what for food and for shelter. So it's kind of fun to learn about those ecosystems. So have a good time with that game, and also the website where you can build a biome if you'd like. And I'll talk to you next week.